Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Brown Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In this episode, I'll be talking about when supplements or medication cause or worsen brain symptoms. So five reasons this can be happening and what can be done. In previous episodes, I've addressed many of the more common contributing factors of brain symptoms, including high pyrroles, copper-zinc imbalances, methylation imbalances, candida overgrowth, mast cell activation, mold, and other forms of toxicity, as well as genetic variants such as COMT and MAOA. Supplements can be needed to address each of these. Medications can also be necessary when treating mold and mast cell activation. But what happens when someone can't tolerate a supplement or medication because it worsens or creates new brain symptoms? In this episode, I'll discuss five common reasons a supplement or medication may worsen symptoms, specific supplements and medications that are more likely to do this, how these reactions can point to specific root causes, and steps that can be taken to improve tolerance. There can be a wide range of brain symptoms that occur when someone is having an adverse reaction, such as fatigue, brain fog, depression, anxiety, agitation, or even psychosis or mania. I'll use reactivity to refer to this range of possibilities. While physical side effects can also occur, The focus here will be on brain symptoms. So five common reasons supplements or meds may worsen symptoms. Number one, immune reactivity. Our immune system is intertwined with our central nervous system. When our body's immune system reacts to a toxin, microbe, injury, or trauma, we can have inflammation of the brain as well as physical symptoms. I often hear people say, I feel like I'm reacting to everything. This makes me think about mast cell activation. If someone is experiencing severe immune reactivity, such as mast cell activation, they may react to many supplements and medications as well as triggers in their environment and stress. A number of triggers can help point to an exaggerated immune response. In my practice, this high immune reactivity is usually driven by a biotoxin, and most commonly, mold toxicity. For many with this obstacle, starting very low and slow can prevent reactions. For others, interventions may be needed to lower immune reactivity and stabilize mast cells. This, however, can require certain supplements. For those who can't tolerate those treatments even, limbic system retraining programs can help calm the immune system and help people move forward more easily. Sensitivity and intolerance. It is possible to have immune sensitivity or even allergy to a supplement, though I find this to be less common. Herbal supplements, for example, which are high in salicylates, may cause symptoms in those with salicylate sensitivity. Certain probiotics have bacterial strains that are high in histamine. This could be an issue for those with histamine intolerance. Number two, too much or too little neurotransmitter activity. Some people with brain symptoms have high neurotransmitter activity and some have low. Common neurotransmitters include serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. I use the term neurotransmitter activity because it's not just about the amount of neurotransmitters present. It's also about the amount of receptors present that pick up neurotransmitters and remove them from the space between nerve cells. High neurotransmitter activity. Too much neurotransmitter activity can cause brain symptoms such as mania, psychosis, agitation, anxiety, panic, obsessions, compulsions, and hyperactivity. Reactions can occur if supplements or medication are given that further increase neurotransmitter activity. Examples include overmethylation. Those with overmethylation already have too much neurotransmitter activity, so giving them supplements or medications that further increase neurotransmitter activity could make them have high anxiety, panic, or even mania or psychosis. 
Another example is a slow COMT and or a slow MAOA. So to remind you, COMT makes an enzyme that clears catecholamines or dopamine and norepinephrine. And a slow MAOA can result in a slowing of the enzyme that clears serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Simply having a variant on the COMT and or MAOA gene doesn't mean that they are being expressed. So what does increase neurotransmitters? SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, these increase serotonin activity. SNRIs, serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, increase serotonin and norepinephrine activity. Stimulant medications such as Ritalin and Adderall increase dopamine activity. SAMe and methionine, which we use for undermethylation, increase serotonin and dopamine activity. Remember that there can be times when there is a mixed picture, such as someone who is undermethylated and thus has low serotonin activity, but they may also have a slow COMT and thus have high activity of dopamine and norepinephrine. What about low neurotransmitter activity? Reactions can occur if supplements or medications decrease the neurotransmitter activity when it is already low. This could look like depression, apathy, fatigue, and brain fog. Examples include undermethylation, a fast COMT, again clearing dopamine and norepinephrine too quickly, or a fast MAOA, again clearing serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine too quickly. What decreases neurotransmitters? Folate, a nutrient that is good for a lot of people, happens to be a big problem with many people with psychiatric conditions. Most with undermethylation have low serotonin symptoms, for example, depression and or anxiety. While folate can help methylation, as an unfortunate aside, it can also further lower serotonin activity. Folate is in most multivitamins and B-complex vitamins. I've previously done an episode on undermethylation, MTHFR, and what I call the great folate debate. What else decreases neurotransmitters? Niacinamide can lower dopamine and norepinephrine. Looking closely at someone's symptoms and traits and assessing methylation through blood work can help determine if neurotransmitters are too high, low, or mixed, and what types of treatment to consider. Number three, poor detoxification or toxic overload. Zinc. Zinc is one of the most powerful tools I use in my work. Some people can easily tolerate it, while others can struggle. There are some reasons someone may not be able to tolerate zinc. High copper. Zinc mobilizes copper. Moving too much copper at once can increase copper symptoms, such as anxiety, anger, hyperactivity, and insomnia. High toxicity. Zinc is a strong antioxidant. It is needed for the genetic expression of one of the most important antioxidants in our body, called metallothionine. When I start someone on zinc, I slowly build it up over three to four weeks. For some, like myself, even this is too fast. So for me, it took me about eight months to get my dose up to the optimal range, which is certainly not the norm. I unknowingly had mold toxicity at the time. Someone with significant metal toxicity could also have difficulties, uh, though again, that's not the norm. Glutathione is another major antioxidant. If someone is having difficulty tolerating it, they may have problems with detoxification and significant toxicity. Again, metals or biotoxins like mold and chemicals. This can start to be addressed in several other ways. Binders. These include bentonite clay, chlorella, activated charcoal, and cholestyramine. These bind toxins, especially mold toxins, in the GI tract. If they are started too quickly, the toxins they are supposed to remove get stirred up, which stirs up symptoms. When people say they can't tolerate certain binders, they usually weren't started low enough. 
Number four, underlying microbial or microbiome issues. B6. B6 is very important for brain health. It is needed for making serotonin, dopamine, and GABA. We use it in all the Walsh nutrient protocols to varying degrees. If you're not familiar with the Walsh Research Institute, I have a previous episode where I interviewed Dr. William Walsh about his research and discoveries, and it's from that research that we assess and create nutrient protocols for those with brain-related symptoms. So again, we use B6 commonly as one of the nutrients in Walsh nutrient protocols. In the last 10 years, however, we've seen a decrease in the tolerance of B6. It's not clear why. I'm including it in this section because the reactivity is suspected to be related to the microbiome. Perhaps in recent years, we have had collective damage to our microbiome from toxins and rising EMF exposure. We simply don't know. The good news is that P5P, the active form of B6, is usually well tolerated. In my practice, I rely heavily on P5P. I will occasionally use it in combination with B6 if it's well tolerated for those especially with high pyrroles. Methionine and or SAMe. Both are used, though usually not together, to help address undermethylation. I suspect candida or mold when someone is having difficulties tolerating either of these. These nutrients are usually better tolerated once candida and or mold are addressed or starting to get addressed. Number five, die-off. Anything that kills off microbes such as candida or mold can cause die-off of the microbes which release toxins when they're dying off and which can worsen symptoms. Antifungal supplements, antifungal medications, and probiotics may cause this type of reactivity. Antifungal medications include nystatin, diflucan, triconazole, and amphotericin B, to name a few. Herbs and food-based supplements can have antimicrobial effects. Turmeric is one example. There are many others, so it's always worth checking. Worsening of symptoms might point to an underlying fungal or other microbial overgrowth. It may also suggest that appropriate binders may be needed first. Addressing or preventing die-off could mean supporting detoxification, starting binders if necessary, and again, starting low and going slow. Antidepressants, interestingly, have been shown in labs to have antifungal effects which makes me wonder if some people who can't tolerate them are actually having die-off. Helpful information. Knowing someone's history of reactions can point to underlying root causes. As you can see, there are ways to help someone tolerate and go on to benefit from a needed supplement or medication. As always, please feel free if you have access on social media to add to this list of supplements or medications, or to share your personal or professional experience. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to receive these newsletters and episodes in your mailbox, please consider subscribing at CourtneySnyderMD.com, where I have information about my mentoring program, as well as my non-patient phone consultations and my treatment practice. I look forward to connecting with you in a future episode. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.